ahead for you know sake of your time as well. Um, everyone, welcome to uh, another installment of our in-service review for Empire. We're very fortunate to have Dr. Kim uh, from Stony Brook, and Dr. Kim did much of his training at Stony Brook in medical school residency, then went in, went on to uh, FPMRS uh, fellowship at Virginia Mason, came back, uh, and he's with us here today um, to discuss very. Very, very high yield uh, topics for the in service. Um, very thankful again to have you, have you, Dr. Kim. And uh, for everyone, just please uh, feel free to add your questions in the chat. If we have some time, we'll we'll go ahead and answer uh, them. Um, and I'll give the mic over to you. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for having me. Um, you know, this is a topic that I think a lot of people uh, need to review right before the in service. Uh, I oftentimes have to review it myself. I've tried to boil it down to Part of the high yield stuff, uh, we don't have much time to talk. So I'll, I'll kind of go through it quickly and stuff that I think that's important. And please feel free to ask any questions. So briefly, I'm gonna just briefly re review the neural control of micturation and then kind of give a brief overview of your dynamics. We'll discuss a few cases and then we'll go over some review questions. So, the uh, let's talk about the innervation of the lower urinary tract to start with. So the lower urinary tract, uh, the bladder and the urethra, are innervated both by both the autonomic system and the somatic system. So when we talk about the autonomic system, uh, we think about the parasympathetic innervations and the sympathetic innervations to the bladder. Um, so the parasympathetic innervations uh, go through the pelvic nerve. Um, and the parasympathetics are mainly responsible for detrusor contraction uh, via the muscarinic receptors. And the M3 is the most selective muscarinic uh, receptor in the bladder. Um, and the neurotransmitter that's used is acetylcholine. So this is actually the target of most of the anti-muscarinic medications, such as Vesicare, um, oxybutin, tolteridine. And, uh, the antimuscarinics pre uh, you know, prevent, um, the, prevent bladder contractions. Next, we'll talk about the sympathetic innervations. The sympathetic innervations are mediated through the hypogastric nerve and they innervate both the bladder and the uh, uh, urethra, the, um, the uh, smooth uh, sphincter, muscle sphincter. And in the bladder, it's mediated by the beta-3 receptors. So, Sympathetic input leads to detrusive relaxation, and in the sphincter muscle, it leads to uh, uh, smooth uh, sphincter contraction. And this is what allows the bladder to fill under most conditions. Um, the newer medication, Mirabegron, acts at this site. It's a beta-3 agonist, so it promotes detrusive relaxation in patients with overactive bladder. Um, then we have the somatic system, and the innervations from the somatic system travels to the pudendal nerve, and that um, innervates the external urethral sphincter or the striatus sphincter and causes contraction. And that's also uh, mediated uh, through the a nicotinic receptor and acetylcholine. So the, uh, parasympathetic, the parasympathetics start in the S2, the S4 region uh, to innervate the bladder. The sympathetics start from the sympathetic chain about from the level T10 to L2, and they have a more um, complicated course. They usually go to the inferior mesenteric uh, plexus, and then, then they travel through the hypogastric nerve to the bladder and the ureter. And some fibers actually uh, go through the pelvic plexus also. And also the somatic or the pudendal uh, nerves arise approximately from the S2 to the S4 region in the sacral spinal cord. Now, uh, I wanna talk about a little bit about the central control of urination. Um, we were talking about the lower urinary tract and what we really see is uh, in the central control, most of, most of uh, voiding is mediated by the pontine micturation center in the pons. And what this does is it coordinates the trusor contraction and external sphincter relaxation. So when the pontine micturation center is active, it sends signals both to the bladder and to the urethral sphincter for coordination of uh, avoiding. And this is usually mediated um, on the bladder through activation of the parasympathetics. And, um, oh, sorry. And then uh, lower down, the signals travel through onus nucleus uh, for somatic control of the sphincter. Uh, 
so most of the time we're actually in the not in the um voiding phase most of the time we're actually in the filling or storing phase and what happens is the free prefrontal cortex basically tells a pontine maturation center, now is not a socially acceptable time to urinate, so hold it, hold it, hold it. And what it does is it sends a signal to the pontine maturation center to, uh, it tonically inhibits the pontine maturation center, and therefore we're in the storage mode. Um, when it's time to urinate, the, the prefrontal cortex sends a signal to the pontine maturation center that it's socially acceptable to avoid and active, activates it, and that's what leads to urination. So um, one thing that we are leaving out in this are some, some of the afferent signals. Um, mostly we talked about the efferent signals and how parasympathetics and sympathetics act on the bladder. Um, some of it's not as well understood. You know, for example, most of the afferent signaling is mediated through parasympathetic signals and receptors on the bladder that get sent up to the prefrontal cortex. And we're not completely sure how that signaling works and how the decision is made to go from the, the um, storage phase to the voiding phase. And also what happens is initially as the bladder fills and the receptors sense this filling, there's actually a relay system through <clears throat> interneurons lower down that activates a sympathetic system which promotes storage. But at some point when the um, receptor sense of bladder is too full, the signals get sent up to the prefrontal cortex uh, and, uh, and uh, it conveys in the urgency to, to void. So that's a very brief overview of the uh, neural control of micturation. Now, I want to talk about your dynamics a little bit. So when we think about your dynamics, there are different components. There's the post void residual measurement. There's a uroflow, which is a measurement of the urine flow. Systometry, which is the filling phase during your dynamics. And there we can determine pressure, volume relationships of the bladder filling. There's an EMG, which uh, measures the sphincter, external striated urethral sphincter activity during filling, voiding, and, and uh, detrusor overactivity, things like that. And pressure flow studies, um, which is a measurement of bladder pressures and urine flow during voiding. And a good urodynamic study should have all these because they're all usually necessary to determine what is happening. So usually we start with a PVR and uroflow. And um, so what I have on the right here are some patterns of uroflows. So a normal uroflow should approach a, a, approach a bell-shaped curve as we see in picture A. Um, usually men should have a uroflow, we say about 15 is normal, 15 cc's per second. Um, Below that, usually there's likely some degree of obstruction, usually, usually due to bladder outlet obstruction, but we can't always say uh, the reason why from just a uroflow. Um, pattern B is a tower-shaped uh, uroflow, which often shows a higher flow rate, and this may be due to things like overactive bladder. Um, pattern C is what we call staccato uh, pattern, and um, that may be seen in dysfunctional voiders or something like that. And uh, D is an interrupted uh, shaped uh, uroflow. And E is a plateau shape. Now, one of the things I'll caution you guys is for pattern D, you know, that looks like an interrupted. And now, like, you know, a lot of times my residents will say it's a straining pattern, but we actually don't know that just from a uroflow because we don't know what the actual detrusor function is. Um, and the plateau shape usually is due to either the, um, poor detrusive contractility or a, some kind of outlet obstruction. So we can start by getting some useful information from the Euroflow and to properly perform Euroflow should have probably at least 150 cc's uh, during the void. So um, to determine the curve contour. So that's usually the first part of the urodynamics. Okay, after we've done that, we do a, a systometry, filling systometry. And so most of our multi-channel urodynamic machines, we have several catheters and tubes associated with it. And usually um, 
we have a six or seven French uh, catheter that goes into the urethra into the bladder, and that serves two purposes. That it serves as a uh, measure of this P vesicle pressure, which is the pressure in the bladder, and is also used to fill the bladder. And then we have another catheter that either goes in the vagina or in the rectum, and that's a pressure sensor, and that that is a uh, estimate of the abdominal pressure. And from those two pressures, we can calculate the detrusor pressure. So the detrusor pressure is the vesicle pressure minus the abdominal pressure. Um, so it's actually the component of the intravesical pressure that's created by forces in the bladder wall and not external forces uh, from pressure in the abdomen. So detrusor pressure is a calculated pressure. And during systometry, we can get um, several your dynamic don't diagnoses and examples of things we can see or look for are involuntary detrusor contractions, uh, also known as detrusor overactivity. We like to check the compliance um, of the bladder and we can assess for incontinence, you know, by measuring the uh, valsalva leak point pressure and detrusor leak point pressure. So the valsalva leak point pressure or abdominal leak point pressure um, is a measurement of the urethral function and or outlet competence. Um, it's the intravesical pressure at which urine leakage occurs due to increased abdominal pressure in the absence of a detrusor contraction. So typically uh, during the filling systometry, maybe at 200 cc's or 300 cc's, we might ask the patient to cough or bear down and see if they leak any urine. If they do, we mark that on the um, uh, urodynamics plot and we look at what their abdominal pressure is at point, and that would um, uh, that would tell us what their abdominal leak point pressure is. Um, usually, abdominal leak point or valsalva leak point pressure is less than sixty. Um, sixty or so indicate the presence of ISD intrinsic sphincter deficiency, um, and then higher leak point pressures usually uh, point to urethral hypermobility in women. But however. Just because you have a higher leak point pressure does not mean it's intrinsic sphincter deficiency. It just means that there's a, a less chance of that. So the detrusor um, leak point pressure is a measurement of compliance. And so lowest value of the detrusor pressure at which leakage is observed in the absence of increased abdominal pressure or detrusor contraction. Now, to be honest, most people don't have a detrusor uh, leak point pressure. Uh, their, their detrusor pressures probably never get high enough for them to leak and they have a competent sphincter, uh, we see this more in uh, patients with neurologic issues. So this is an example of your dynamics during the filling systometry. Um, so we look at the lines, first of all, so the top line is abdominal pressure, so that's a tube in the rectum or vagina. The next one is a vesicle pressure, which is the uh, catheter in the bladder. And then the detrusor pressure, um, is a calculated pressure of the uh, vesicle minus abdominal. And in the beginning of the test, what we always check for is to see whether the tubes are um, working appropriately. So the first thing I look for is, is a cough in the beginning. And the when you cough, that causes abdominal pressure. So you should see a spike in the abdominal pressure like we do here. And that should be transmitted to the vesicle pressure. However, the detrusor muscle is not doing anything in addition to that abdominal pressure, so the calculated detrusor pressure should be minimal. So we see that this cough here, we, we, we see this spike in the abdominal pressure. However, the uh, detrusor pressure looks um, low, so we know that the tubes are functioning appropriately. So the next thing we see is, uh, this is our fill volume. And you know we usually fill at a moderate rate, probably about 50 to 60 cc's per minute. And we see what happens. We, add, we ask patients for sensations, for their first sensation, first desire to void, normal um, desire, and stronger desire to void. And we mark that on the scan too. Now, one thing is like it, here about 200 cc's, they're doing a uh, probably valsalva leak point pressure test. And so the patient is asked to cough. And again, we can see there's no transmission to the detrusor. Uh, um, um, there's no increase in detrusor pressure. So we know this is a technically good study. And what we see here is we actually, a lot of times we'll see an increase in sphincter activity and that's normal. 
um, and we see no leakage here. So that means this patient does not have stress urinary incontinence. And the filling capacity goes all, the filling systometry goes all the way up until the patient denotes capacity or the strong desire to void. So this is an example of detrusor contractions, detrusor overactivity uh, during filling. So once again, we can see that this is a technically good study here. And as we fill at about 160 cc's, what we see is we see a spike in the vesicle pressure, detrusor pressure. And so we know this is all from detrusor because there's no increase in the abdominal pressure. And we also see some associated urinary leakage here. So this patient would have detrusor overactivity with uh, urinary leakage. And here we see a spike in the EMG activity. And this is usually a voluntary guarding type reflex as a, if a patient has an involuntary detrusor con contraction, oftentimes they'll consciously kind of um, tighten their sphincter to try to get rid of it. So um, this is actually a finding we call pseudo dyssynergia. This is not dyssynergic, this is a normal response. Okay. Um, so now, uh, this is an example of stress urinary incontinence during filling systometry. Once again, we see there's no pressure transmission to the detrusor line. And as we fill, we do a, 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 a stress test at about 200 cc's, and we can see that the patient coughed and or bared down Valsalva to make good pressure. This is 75 CMH2O. And um, what we see is there was urinary leakage, so we would denote a Valsalva leak point pressure of 75 CMH2O. Okay. Um, another important thing that we need to mention, measure during the filling systometry is compliance. So the volume for compliance is change in volume over change in pressure. And what we see here is the abdominal pressure remains relatively constant, but as we're filling, the vesicle and detrusor pressures start increasing. And so what we hear, we do see some leakage here, when the, when the um, detrusor pressures are at 60 CMH2O, so that would be the detrusor leak point pressure. Um, and in this person, the change in volume, 250 cc's uh, over 60. Um, sorry, yep. Yeah. So the, the DLPP would be right here, and the detrusor pressures are quite high when they, um, uh, at the DLPP, but some people don't leak here. And so we, we measure compliance and there's different measures of compliance. Um, some, I think they say, uh, some people use a value of 12 or 20 uh, to determine a poorly compliant bladder. So in this patient, you know, the compliance is 250 mLs over, over 60, which is four, which would be a poorly compliant bladder. You know, this person, you know, is in danger of upper tract uh, damage uh, if this were to go untreated. Okay, so once they've reached capacity, uh, the next part of the test is pressure flow studies. And these are kind of the uh, gold standard method of assessing for bladded outlet obstruction versus a contractility. So while the Euroflow could suggest that, you know, patient might have bladder outlet obstruction, we can't prove that until we actually see what the detrusor uh, is doing during voiding. So common diagnosis that we can get during the pressure flow uh, part of the test include um, for, we can assess for bladder outlet obstruction. Examples of these are in men, BPH, you know, possibly prostate cancer. Um, in females, uh, maybe a sling that was put in too tight or pelvic organ prolapse, especially anterior prolapse when there's kinking of the urethra. And or functional obstruction, such as dysfunctional voiding, detrusor sphincter dyssynergia, or primate bladder and neck obstruction. Um, or we can assess for detrusor acontractility, which might be from diabetes, a neurogenic issue, idiopathic, uh, some, sometimes iatrogenic from pelvic surgery, such as a radical hysterectomy, a colon resection, something like that. Okay, so now let's look at the pressure flow study. So up until the permission to void, that's a filling cystometry. And in this patient, uh, the, the patient was given the permission to void. And basically uh, we see that there is an increase in the um, detrusor pressure. And this patient uh, 
detrusive pressure rose to about 15 CMH2O. And then uh, we see that the flow rate right here appears to be, uh, it seems to be like a bell-shaped curve and the flow rate is 25 cc's per second. So this patient is voiding pretty well at low pressures and we don't see there's any abdominal component to that. So there's means there's no abdominal straining. A um, couple formulas that might be useful are the bladder outlet obstruction index. Um, now this has been validated in males, but not females. And what we, uh, the formula for the bladder outlet obstruction index is the detrusive pressure at Q max minus two, uh, minus two times the uh, peak flow. And if it's greater than 40, it suggests obstruction. If it's between 20 and 40, it's considered equivocal. And if it's less than 20, we may consider it to be unobstructed. The other formula that we often use is a bladder contractility index. And this is the detrusive pressure at, uh, at Q max time plus five times Q max. And strong would be greater than 150, normal is 100 to 150, and weak is less than 100. So, Let's look at this uh, study. Again, this is the uh, filling cystometry. Permission to void is right here. And what we see is this patient generates a true surge about 80 CMH2O and only generates a flow of six cc's per second. And by the way, I forgot to mention, we do see that the EMG muscle, uh, the EMG here, silences when the sphincter relaxes uh, and that's, that should happen during normal voiding. So if we were to contract, uh, so in this patient, what we're seeing is high pressure voiding with low flow, which is suggestive in a male of bladder outlet obstruction. Um, and if we calculate the bladder outlet ob out obstruction index, it's, uh, it would be the detrusive pressure Q max here, which is 80 CMH2O uh, minus and then it would be two times the peak flow, so that would be 12, two times six, and we get 68. And as, as we had seen, if we see, get 68, that's greater than 40, so that suggests that there is obstruction. Okay, now this is an example of an acontractile detrusor. So permission to void is given right here. Our EMG muscle, our EMG recording silences appropriately, um, uh, denoting a relaxed sphincter, but what we see is this patient never generates any detrusor pressure, and this patient may void a little bit. It also again a, uh, a poor flow, um, and if we calculate the bladder outlet um, uh, obstruction index again, no, I'm sorry, the bladder outlet obstruction index in this patient is unobstructed. If we if we calculate the bladder contractile contractility index, which is um, P detrusor at Q max, so this here it's only two, plus five times Q max, so that would be five times six is 30, and so this number is 32. As I mentioned previously, less than 100 would be considered um, a weak uh, contractility, and but, but it's pretty obvious here because there's almost no detrusor pressure generated. Okay, um, I mentioned the EMG, and it's a measurement of the external urethral sphincter activity. And this is important for diagnoses such as dysfunctional voiding and detrusor sphincter dyssynergia. So normally we should see an active EMG when the external sphincter is closed. And then when permission is given to void, the external sphincter should relax and silence, and then it should contract at the end and we should see increased activity after voiding is finished. So in this example, what we see is when permission to void is given that the patient generates good detrusor pressure, <clears throat> however, flow is, looks terrible. Um, but we also see increased EMG activity throughout this. So this is not appropriate. The EMG should silence. And in this patient, we, we would need a little bit more of a history because this could be dysfunctional voiding versus detrusor sphincter dyssynergia. And detrusor, the, the reason we need more history is detrusor sphincter dyssynergia is only present in patients with neurologic issues. 
So let's say the patient has multiple sclerosis, then we would call this detrusive sphincter dyssynergia. Oops. If this were a neurologically intact person, we would call this dysfunctional voiding. So by definition, a patient with no neurologic issues cannot have detrusive sphincter dyssynergia. And we often get video urodynamics, and it's very helpful in these cases. Um, in women with dysfunctional voiding, we may see a pattern such as this, what we call the um, uh, uh, spinning top urethra right here, which is a, a non-relaxation of the sphincter. Um, and then in neurogenic people, what we can see are, this is approaching an end-stage neuropathic bladder. It almost looks like a Christmas tree shape. Um, these are a lot of trabeculations and probably some small diverticulum within the bladder. And uh, we can also see reflux up here. So especially in neurogenic patients or patients with neurologic issues, it's very important to get the um, fluoroscopy so uh, we can see what their bladder looks like. And as we can see here, it looks like this patient has increasing detrusor pressures as we fill, which probably indicate, it's hard to see the numbers, but it would probably indicate a poorly compliant bladder. This is the vesicle pressure, this is a detrusor pressure, and you see abdominal pressure is pretty low, but this increases here. Okay. So let's talk about some neurologic conditions here. Um, I'm gonna highlight a couple cases here of patients with neurologic issues at different um, areas in the nervous system, and it'll kind of help us give examples of the voiding pattern and what to look for. So we have an 87-year-old female with urgency incontinence, frequency, and nocturia that started two months after a left frontal lobe CVA. So when, when we get your dynamics in this patient, what we might this is what we might see as a representative example during the filling phase. We might have an involuntary detrusive contraction with leak. Um, during the filling, we can see the detrusive pressure goes up. Um, and this is a common um, pattern for uh, um, lesions above the uh, uh, lesions from the pons and higher. So basically, anything in the brain can lead to so any lesion above the pons or cortex above the pons or in the cortex leads to detrusor overactivity. The bladder is overactive. However, the sphincter is normal and coordinated. So basically what happens here is, I had mentioned in the beginning that the signals from the uh, prefrontal cortex tonically inhibit the pontine maturation center. However, a lot of lesions in the brain, this signaling pathway gets lost, so the PMC is always active, and it leads to a contraction of the detrusor muscle, detraction of the detrusor, contraction of the detrusor muscle, sorry, I can't speak, been a long day, and relaxation of the sphincter. So basically, the patient's bladder may uh, um, have detrusor overactivity, but whenever that happens, the sphincter uh, empties in a coordinated fashion. So it's an involuntary detrusor contraction, an involuntary sphincter um, relaxation. However, it's a coordinated response. And treatments to this are similar to non-neurogenic overactive bladder, you know, first line, ther first line therapies, behavioral therapies, pharmacotherapy, and then third line therapies such as Botox, PTNS, or sacral neuromodulation. Now, going down a little bit, neuro uh, lesions of the suprasacral spinal cord. Um, so in this example, we have a 52-year-old with female with urgency, incontinence, frequency, and nocturia in a history of multiple sclerosis. So multiple sclerosis is a demyelinating disease, uh, and it can affect anywhere in the system. Um, and so let's see what ha happens here. During the filling phase, what we see is we see uh, an episode of detrusor overactivity. We don't see any leak in this example, um, but we do see detrusor overactivity. And then when we actually give the permission to void, the patient generates good detrusor pressure to void, but we have a crappy flow here, and we see increased sphincter activity. And as I mentioned, the EMG should be silent if it's increased in a patient with neurologic disease during voiding. Um, then this is probably detrusor sphincter dyssynergia. Okay, 
So um, what happens in the uh, lesions in the suprasacral spine, that cord region, um, here, right here, we have an overactive bladder with a spastic sphincter and the, there's dyssynergia. So there's lack of coordination between the sphincter and the uh, detrusor muscle um, because the signaling pathways here get um, messed up. And this is actually kind of one of the more dangerous patterns because the bladder may spasm with a closed sphincter and this may lead to reflux and, and, and that end stage neuropathic bladder, the Christmas tree shape and uh, can cause a lot of issues. So this is why video urodynamics is also very important in these patients because we, we can assess for reflux and hydronephrosis. Um, so the typical treatments for these kind of patients are clean intermittent catheterization to minimize the bladder volumes, coupled with either uh, pharmacotherapy, anticholinergics, beta-3 agonists, and a lot of times these days we're using um, uh, Botox. Um, if they're unable to uh, intermittently catheterize, you can uh, consider some kind of urinary uh, diversion, such as a, a, a mitrofenoff, an ileovesicostomy, ileal loop, or possible bladder augmentation. Um, these patients, uh, we should avoid the use of indelling catheters. And the other thing about suprasacral cord lesions is we have to be cognizant of autonomic dysreflexia. So, for example, a patient with a spinal cord injury typically is above the, uh, I think, level T6 or so. Um, you have to watch out for autonomic dysreflexia. And what happens is that's unregulated. So you get the stimuli below the level of the injury and at least the um, uh, unregulated autonomic, out, um, autonomic um, discharge. And it can lead to excessively high blood pressures and a reflex bradycardia and sweating and flushing. And so uh, examples of this is might, might be when you're performing cystoscopy in a, in a paraplegic uh, spinal cord injury, you might start seeing high blood pressure. Um, the first thing you should do is, drain, is remove the noxious stimuli by draining the bladder. Um, and if that doesn't work, you probably have to administer nitrates to try to lower the blood pressure. Um, my residents know we had one, we had a uh, individual, an 18 year old kid, motorcycle accident who has spinal cord injury, was paraplegic. Um, and he had a super pubic tube. And every time we tried to change it, he would uh, uh, get dangerously high blood pressures. So we actually had to bring him to the emergency room for every super pubic tube change to get uh, nitropase because oral medications didn't work with him. So you have to be very careful in these patients. Um, okay, the next level is a sacral spinal cord or peripheral lesions. And so in this case, we have a 62 year old female with incontinence, urinary frequency and nocturia that started after colorectal surgery. So in this case, uh, what we see is we see that this is a technically good test. Uh, we don't see that there's any stress urinary incontinence uh, here. And we see the EMG is uh, uh, appropriately working during the, um, during the uh, cough. Now when permission, permission is given to void, we see that the patient makes, all, makes zero detrusor pressure and uh, has a poor flow. Um, this example doesn't show, but oftentimes this is where we might see abdominal straining pattern where uh, we see the patient actively trying to valsalva to, to let it out with a poor flow. Um, I think, and so if we, um, if we uh, calculated the uh, formulas of bladder outlet obstruction index, uh, we have the uh, pressure at Qmax is two and, and the um, peak flow is 12. Uh, so the formula would tell us that this patient is unobstructed, and then if we did the bladder contractility index, it would come to less than 100, indicating poor contractility. So really, these lesions are from the sacral region, and when we uh, have a injury to this area, we get an acontractile uh, bladder and a flaccid sphincter and the coordination, it, there's no coordination because both of them aren't working. And this is kind of the sacral um, reflex arc that we talk about with the bulbal cavernosis reflex. So um, you can ass assess for an intact sacral spinal cord response. Um, in a female, you pinch the clitoris and put your finger in the rectum to feel for a, a appropriate um, contraction. In the male, you uh, 
you can pinch the head of the penis. Now, even in neurologically, only 70% of neur, uh, neurologically intact females have this, so just the absence doesn't absolutely indicate the absence of this. However, it's a good screening tool. Um, so for these neurogenic bladders, uh, the sacral cord area, the treatment is use a clean intermittent catheterization to minimize bladder volumes, and if it's if they're unable to perform intermittent catheterization for, then you would consider a urinary diversion, a suprapubic tube, so forth. Um, you know, we try to avoid indwelling catheters um, for the most part. You know, these are the patients that we see this, these horrible erosions in the females, you know, with gaping urethras where you can put four fingers in them and males, uh, they're the ones that get the uh, erosions, you know, leading to like hypospadias like defects. So we pretty aggressively tried to avoid the use of indwelling catheters. Um, I kind of highlighted an example for lesions in each part of the in the the brain in the supracycle spinal cord and the sacral spinal cord, but it gets more complicated, and I just don't have time to go over all of this. But basically, um, the first thing you should do if a patient with neurologic condition neurologic condition is kind of figure out where it is, and then you can figure out the pattern. Um, you know. So the suprapontine causes are traumatic brain injuries, strokes, um, Parkinson's disease, things like that. Um, you know, we, we see a lot of patients in my practice that have had strokes and they're fully recovered and then they, get, they develop new onset urgency incontinence and no one has explained to them that there's a known association. Um, supracycle causes, you know, we see a lot of MS, we see, uh, you know, spina bifida, traumas, uh, spinal cord injuries, and infrasacral causes, uh, diabetes, cardioquina, um, you know, uh, pelvic surgery injuries, uh, uh, ra especially radical surgery and pelvic trauma fractures and traumas. So if you can locate where the neurologic condition exists, what part of the uh, system, you usually can figure out the voiding pattern. Okay. I guess uh, at this point, do you want me to stop and see if there's any questions before I move on to some uh, review questions? Um, sure, there, there was one question that was a while ago, but um, I think it will get answered in some of these questions. Um, I, I even know this one in service question I just looked at the other day. So yeah, I think if we go with the questions and if there's still questions at the end, we can go through it. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I just picked out a few, uh, I think about four questions from um, la uh, the 2020 uh, SASP, the ones that are kind of I thought were um, important for this talk. So this question is one month after L5 laminectomy, a 30 year old woman develops lower extremity weakness, a PVR of 300 mLs, and an intermittent urinary stream. Video urodynamics demonstrated detrusor sphincter dyssynergia. The most likely explanation is, now I found this question to be very interesting because there's multiple parts to it. Um, I think the tendency is, wow, she had an L5 laminectomy. The, the voiding pattern is probably related to the L5 laminectomy. Um, so, but the important finding here, I think, is that we have the detrusor sphincter dyssynergia. So based on what the information I just presented, this should be a lesion of the suprasacral spinal cord. Um, and now we just got to figure out which one of these can cause that. So pseudodysynergia. So this is, a, this is the finding of increased EMG activity during an episode of detrusor overactivity. Um, so this, this would not be the case. Um, recurrent lumbar disc herniation. Um, at first glance, you might think this may be related after an L5 laminectomy, but if you recall the level of detrusor uh, sphincter dyssynergia, it's in the suprasacral spinal cord. Um, and, whoop, sorry. Cauda equina uh, syndrome is in is, is below the super, suprasacral uh, spinal cord and it usually, usually leads more to urinary retention type picture. Um, undiagnosed multiple sclerosis, this is the correct answer because it can lead to the detrusor sphincter dyssynergia avoiding pattern. Um, and also permanent nerve injury from the laminectomy. You might say L5, uh, oh wait, that's above the suprasacral spinal cord. But remember, this is the vertebral level. And at the L5 uh, uh, vertebral level is really the level of the cona medullaris or some of the uh, sacral uh, 
um, roots. Um, I'm sorry, the cona medullaris. The sacral spinal cord actually, I think it ends at about level L1, L2. So you also have to remember the vertebral levels. So the answer here would be undiagnosed multiple sclerosis. Again, it, it's kind of figuring out where the level of the um, dysfunction is. Detrusive sphincter dyssynergia, uh, suprasacral spinal cord. Okay. Sorry about the uh, um, not straight picture. Uh, I was given the questions this way. Someone scanned them in crooked. A 58-year-old man has incontinence when you're following radical prostatectomy. Your dynamic evaluation demonstrates normal bladder capacity and no detrusor overactivity. At 250 mLs, Valsalva maneuver increases a bladder pressure to 150 cmH2O without evidence of urinary leakage. Um, so in this patient, he had radical prostatectomy. And um, we know with radical prostatectomy, there's an association with stress urinary incontinence. However, he may have also had overactive bladder um, prior to that, maybe fit in a large prostate. But your dynamic evaluation demonstrates normal bladder capacity, no detrusor overactivity, so we can basically rule out overactive bladder. At 250 mL, valsalva maneuver increases bladder pressure to 150 cmH2O without evidence of urinary leakage. So the next step is, well, this gentleman's complaining of urinary leakage, but we haven't demonstrated it, so why not? Um, let's see. We could remove the catheter and repeat the valsalva maneuver, repeat your dynamic study with a suprapubic catheter, Euroflow, retrograde urethrogram, or cystoscopy. Um, the correct answer here is to remove the catheter and repeat with the Valsalva maneuver. These catheters, although they, they're small, they can actually cause some obstruction, and that may be enough to prevent um, urinary leakage. Uh, I think Jerry Blavis did a study years back that showed patients, you know, may, their, his study showed that patients Patients may have had a normal Euroflow, an initial Euroflow, and if, during the pressure flow analysis, if they avoided the same amount, a, a significant number went from an unobstructed voiding pattern to an obstructed voiding pattern uh, during voiding, and, and that's usually because a catheter might cause some obstruction. So in this case, we would, should remove it and try it, and I bet you there'd be stress in our incontinence. Um, repeating your dynamics with a suprapubic tube, that's just uh, too extreme to put a suprapubic catheter in. Um, Euroflow probably wouldn't tell us that much. Your retrograde urethrogram and cystoscopy. Um, I guess it's something you consider uh, later if if um, if the patients had a radical prostatectomy because there might be a bladder neck contracture that might be contributing to some of this. But the first step would be to remove the catheter and repeat the uh, urodynamics. Okay. Um, let's see. The next question is: Three months following a CBA. A 67-year-old woman develops urinary urgency incontinence. Uh, video urodynamic testing will most likely show detrusor overactivity and simultaneous. Okay, so we said the CVA usually is a lesion above the pons, and in those patients, what we usually see is detrusor overactivity, and we see coordinated sphincter activity. Um, so involuntary smooth and striated muscular contraction, involuntary smooth sphincter contraction, striated sphincter relaxation, um, involuntary smooth muscle sphincter relaxation, striated sphincter contraction, involuntary smooth muscle and striated sphincter relaxation, and uh, sphincter bradykinesia. Um, so remember, this is a coordinated response. So uh, basically, in this case, the patient's having an episode of uh, the bladder uh, emptying, the detrusive muscle squeezing. So we would have both sphincters um, acting in coordination for relaxation. It would be involuntary, however, there would be a coordinated response. Okay. Um, an 88-year-old man with advanced Parkinson's disease and long-standing history of LUTs developed urinary retention. Um, pressure flow study shows a detrusor pressure of 8 cmH2O with maximum mural flow rate of 2 ml per second. DRE reveals a 40 gram prostate. So the next step is, all right. So I'll just tell Parkinson's disease. If you look at the uh, table that we uh, that I 
put in this talk is usually um, above the ponds. And as such, whoops, as such, it usually causes detrusor overactivity. That's the number one voiding pattern uh, with Parkinson's disease. Um, however, this patient developed urinary retention. And then uh, pressure flow studies show that a detrusor pressure of eight cm of water and maximum mirror flow of two mLs per second. So what we can say is a patient is generating very poor detrusor pressure and has a poor urinary flow rate. Um, so what is the next step? So if we calculate some of uh, the formulas we use, the bladder outlet obstruction index, the um, detrusor pressure at Qmax is 8 cm H2O. And then, um, the, and then the flow rate is two. So if we take this number and multiply time, this one times two, that's eight minus four, so the number is four. And that tells us the patient is likely unobstructed. Um, and similarly, if we uh, calculate the, the bladder contractility index, what we see is a detrusor pressure at Qmax, whoops, is eight. And, and, and if we add that to five times this, 10, so that would be 18, and it's less than 100. So the, the patient is may, has poor bladder contractility. Um, so what can we do for a patient that isn't contracting his bladder well? Well, bethanicol, that's really not recommended to be used at all. There's no uh, evidence that it works. Um, we could consider intermittent catheterization as a way to empty his bladder. However, I think in this question, what they want to get at is the patient's Parkinson's disease and may not be able to uh, uh, perform intermittent catheterization. Um, suprapubic tube seems like a good option. Uh, sacral neural modulation. Um, technically, sacral neural modulation is not FDA approved for any neurologic issues. Um, however, in this case, it actually might be a reasonable option. However, it's definitely it would be considered more of an off-label type use. And there's no indication for TERP here as the patient appears to be unobstructed and has poor contractility. So I think the appropriate answer should be suprapubic tube placement. Um, I think I'm gonna stop here and see if anyone has any questions. Um, uh, feel free to write them in the comments or chat box, or if you wanna email me, feel free to email me. If you wanna copy my slides, I'd be more than happy to send them out. Um, thanks. Oh, that was really great. Um, thank you, Dr. Kim. There was one question earlier. Um, mm -hmm. it, it was on one of your earlier slides, but yeah. it was from Nathan, just regarding a healthy male, he'd ask um, what can cause an atonic bladder in healthy um, men? Um, in a healthy male without neurologic conditions? Yeah, can anything, um, I think he was asking, can anything cause an atonic bladder? Sure. I mean, you know, uh, sometimes in a large prostate, if, if, if it's gone on too long, you know, we've seen all those men in retention. Um, let me just think. I mean, um, do psychotropic drugs ever cause this? Um, yes, yeah, psychotropic drugs can, can cause urinary retention sometimes. Yes. Um, Outside of that, um, there seems to be no other questions. Dr. Kim, thank you so much. I mean, this is going to be an amazing review. We're going to throw it up on our um, uh, YouTube uh, series, which seems to be getting hundreds and hundreds of views after the session. So um, thank you again for this high yield review. Um, very much appreciated. And again, if anyone has any questions, uh, Dr. Kim's email is there, or you can reach out to us, uh, part of the Empire crew, and we'd be happy to redirect or reroute questions. Um, All right, I guess I went a little under. I was worried about going over, but- uh, No, it's perfect timing.